We're so glad that you could join us today for a time of worship and praise and study of God's Word together. We'll be singing three hymns today, and before that, though, we have some big news about our church. Next Sunday, Lake Phelan Community Church is planning to hold our church service in person at the church. Much preparation is being done to provide for this getting together again as soon as possible and with safety. We will be providing for you, whoever wants one, face masks and gloves. There will also be hand sanitizers on site. We will be marking the seating areas for separation distances, including every other pew being blocked. Families will be allowed to sit together but everyone else needs to follow the distance guidelines. We plan to take and measure everyone's temperature as they enter the building. We also encourage you to give feedback and all of your input as we work through this process together. We will not be allowing any food to be served or any physical contact and greetings. In addition, this week, Pastor is in Nebraska And he will be returning at the end of the week uh, from Nebraska. So he'll be here with us together next Sunday to run the service in person. Now let's turn our hearts to the Lord as we sing. And if you're at home and you care to stand and sing, that would be fine. We'll start with, He giveth more grace. Oh 
Again, it's so good to bring you the news. I'll be repeating it here just in case someone had missed it earlier. Next Sunday, Lake Phelan Community Church is planning to hold our church service in person at the church. Much preparation is being done to make our getting together possible and safe. We will be providing for those who want face masks and gloves, along with hand sanitizers. We will be marking the pews and the seating areas for separation, including every other pew being blocked. Families will be allowed to sit together. We plan to take non-contact temperature measurements also. Please encourage uh, from you all feedback and give your input so we can work through this new process together. There will be no food distributed and no physical greetings. And again, Pastor is in Nebraska right now with his family this week, and he will be returning for our service next Sunday. Before we enter our time of teaching, we're going to take a time of prayer together and look at some concerns and needs from our church and from those that we are caring for and praying for. First, I have this note that some of you that get the email would have seen already. This is from Kari Gustafson. She says, I would appreciate your prayers this week. I've been having some strange neurological symptoms and ear problems. I'll be having a brain MRI this afternoon, and this was on June 10th, and a hearing test on Thursday. I'll hopefully get results later this week or by the end of the month. And Kari is in Minnesota right now. The other news, it's a little bit longer, and I'll read a portion of it, was an email that was sent from Josh Tokar. He starts it out saying, there's good news and bad news. First, the best news. Sveta and the boys now have tickets to come to the U.S. on June 17th. And just this Friday, we received an appointment notice for her citizenship interview on June 24th. That was a huge answer to prayer. Now regarding Josh's medical situation, he has been diagnosed with stage 1 cancer. The good news is that after surgery to remove the tumor, blood tests have revealed that my numbers have gone down into the normal range. I was hoping that would be the end of my treatment. However, the doctors have said there's still a 50-50 chance that the cancer may reoccur in the next few months. So he's been looking at possibly getting some invasive surgery or chemotherapy to reduce those odds down. Doing nothing, he'll have a 50-50 chance if the cancer reoccurs. The treatment options would be worse if he were to do something now, but he believes that he's got to make a decision um, tentatively scheduled for June 30th. So right now, they don't know what their future is for Ukraine. They're still hoping that they'll be able to go back in August and continue their work in the Kiev Christian Academy and the Evangelical Theological Seminary, Lord willing. So they're soliciting your prayers during this time. And Lord, we bring to you Katie Biggie, who is now in transition from Send International. We're praying for wisdom for her as she seeks the next phase in her new plans to serve the Lord. Lord, also we pray for many in our congregation who have different needs and special things going on. Right now, for Joan to be able to go back to work soon. We pray also for Amy to find another job in her field and for both of them to be safe as they go back to work. Also for safety for Jeff as he continues to work in the Senior Care Center. We pray especially for the family of Karen Finney, who passed away recently. And there are others who work in the world from our congregation to keep them in mind the safety for Spring, Leah, Lisa, and others who are interacting with a lot of people in concentrated areas. And finally, on Sunday today, Pastor Hiley's mother's family will be holding their funeral service for his mom. Again, it's going to be Sunday afternoon around 1 o'clock when the service is being held. And Lord, we pray for them that that service would be honoring to you and to the family and care for them as they are together again. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, here's Psalm 4. Uh, you might start turning there in your Bibles as we get there. Continuing on in this series uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, the main title of this psalm I've labeled Peace and Security in the Lord. From verse 8, the last verse in the psalm, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. You'll probably get a lot of the themes from our singing here in this hymn, and it was done intentionally, so hopefully it'll make sense. Today we continue our study in the book of Psalms. As a reminder from last week, we saw in Psalms expressions of people's hearts and feelings toward God. The full depth and width of their emotions is expressed in the book. From joy to sadness, loneliness and unrest, fear and doubt and confidence to name a few. We also see in this book expressions for longing for justice and fairness when it doesn't seem to be occurring. Last week from Psalm 3, we saw this summary just as a review. When life falls apart. There are times when life falls apart. When life falls apart, you must know who God is and how to lay hold of him in prayer. When you lay hold of the Lord in prayer, you will experience his peace. And finally, believing prayer depends completely on God for deliverance. Again, please turn with me to Psalm 4. And if you want to read together with me, you can. Psalm 4. For the choir director on stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Answer me when I call, O my God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O sons of men, how long will you, my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grains and new wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. May God bless the reading of his word. A brief outline of this psalm. Verse 1 is a call to God during times of distress. Next section is to consider your circumstances with confidence. Next, direct everyone to trust in the Lord. Next, ask the Lord to bless. And finally, rest in peace and security in the Lord. There's a bit of historical context for this psalm. And there are three crises. The first one is a crisis of drought. I need to make sure I give the credit to this from a teacher, uh, Walter Kaiser. Uh, he's giving a course that's a free course online at biblicaltraining.org. And I found these uh, historical notes from that course on Psalm 4. Again, it's Walter Kaiser, um, and he's a teacher um, during that class. So the first crisis is a crisis of drought. The second one is a crisis because the king is supposed to be responsible for rain, and there's a drought. So they're concerned that the king isn't doing what he's supposed to do. And finally, the king is supposed to be potent in prayer, and when things aren't happening, everybody blames him. 
Crisis, crisis, crisis. In the heading of the psalm, it says for the choir director on stringed instruments. A psalm of David. The choir director here, this phrase is used in the title of 53 psalms in our Bible. It's also used in some other historical books. The main meaning of the term is to lead in music with the idea that it is to be performed under his direction. There are massively large organized um, musical uh, assemblies and instruments and choirs throughout the time of, of the kings, especially with David and others. Um, and you can read about those in Chronicles mainly. Um, there's other places, but there's a whole chapter in the book of Chronicles dealing just with the organization of the people that were ministering and leading. And there's 288 people that were organizing that assembly. Next, it says on stringed instruments. It's a really vague word. We don't know exactly what it means. So it's a stringed instrument, but we don't really know what it is. It could be something like a guitar, something with strings and picks. We don't really know, but it is a stringed instrument. A lot of speculation, but we really don't know. Next, it says it's a psalm. Psalm is a song to the Lord. And of David, the king of Israel. The first section of this psalm in verse 1 is the call to God during times of distress. Verse 1, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. So we see a time in this author's life when he's calling to God for help during a time of distress. He's calling boldly. We'll see that in a minute here as we go further. And finally, he says, be gracious to me and hear my prayer. The psalmist is imploring boldly to God for help with three imperatives. These are basically do-it words to the Lord. Lord, 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 do it, do it, do it. First is answer me. This is to answer and respond and testify and speak and shout. Jump on it, Lord. Answer me. Answer me. Next, be gracious to me. To be gracious. Show me favor. Show me pity. I need your help. And finally, hear my prayer. This is to hear and to listen and to obey. He's expecting an answer when he says to hear. Hear and listen and give me what you can give me to help in my need. All of these things to be doing it when I call. This phrase, when I call, is commonly used throughout the Old Testament. We'll look at a few of these examples. Jeremiah 33.3, call, the Lord is telling the believers, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. The Lord is imploring us and the believers to call on him, ask him for help, and he says he will answer. Psalm 145.18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Psalm 50.15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. The Lord is anxious to help, to rescue during your times of trouble, your days of trouble. And day is just a generic period. It could be a day, a week, a month, who knows how long. It could occur over and over again. Just keep calling, he says. From Isaiah 65, 24, it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The Lord knows ahead of time what we're going to say, but he still asks us to call. 
He wants us to plead with him, to come to him. And he says, I know what you're going to ask. Ask it anyway. I want you to ask. That's the way our relationship is. Psalm 91.15, he will call upon me and I will answer him. Again, again, call, answer, call, answer. I will be with him in trouble. In times when things are not easy, I will be with him. I will rescue him and honor him. He doesn't just get us out of the trouble. He elevates us back to honor us. Sorry, I hit that too fast. And then from the New Testament, one example, John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We use the phrase all the time, in Jesus' name. To call on God in his name. Note also, he is directing his call to the character of God. Consider this. O God of my righteousness. The righteousness that is there is from God. You have relieved me in my distress. So to summarize this so far, God has shown a prior pattern of relieving David, so David expects God to do it again. Why is that? Because God doesn't change. David saw God faithful in assisting him in the past, So he's expecting God to continue to remain faithful to assist him. In spite of the circumstances, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the trials and troubles and tribulations, God does not change. He heard you, he listened, he answered. He'll do it again and again and again. What does he do? He does, he gives us relief. Relief here is to give a wide space. This is contrasting here in Genesis 26, 22 with this phrase. At last, the Lord has made room for us. This made room for us is the same word as to relieve here. And there's a lot of reasons why translators do that. But it could be just, you could put it back there. He made room to, to give it to me here in this psalm, but the translators chose a different word. And then, in my distress. Now, to contrast with relief, distress is a narrow, tight space with distress and adversaries. You're between a rock and a hard place. You're in that place where you really don't want to be pinched in, where things are not easy to get out of. There's no wiggle room. You're stuck. And God is being asked to provide a wide space to relieve the pressure in your life. Call to God during times of distress, the first part of the psalm. The second section, verses 2 and 3, consider your circumstances with confidence. Verse 2, O sons of men, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. O sons of men. This phrase likely should be modified to high-ranking men or high-born men. Again, from that study that I'm under right now, from Bruce Waltke's study, in comparing, there's two Hebrew words that are next together here. Um, and those words occur only three times in the Old Testament in that pairing. The first one is in Psalm 49.2, where it says both low and high. And high there is, is the word that we're using here in Psalm 4. The other one is in Psalm 62.9, Men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. So we have these people in verse 2 that are being addressed by the psalmist are of high rank 
uh, and they are um, they are contrasted with low degree and low persons. So likely David's accusers here in this section are likely his own leadership, his own leaders, the people that he has around him. And he's saying to them, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long? My honor, which is my glory, my honor, my abundance, my splendor. People are doing things about David and his character, saying, you're not fulfilling what you should do as a king. You're not bringing us rain. You're not leading us. You're not having the Lord provide crops. You're not praying right, etc., etc. And they're attacking him. They're attacking his honor and his splendor. And they're switching it out for reproach, which is disgrace, shame, confusion, and insult. Then he adds another pairing. How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Again, how long will you love what is worthless? That is, what is vain? What is unable to accomplish any goals? Part of the idea here connected to later when we get into the psalm is that they were shifting away their focus from believing that God could help them to believing that possibly one of the other gods, in lowercase gods, has the ability to somehow bring them a harvest, bring them rain, to give them things that they need. And David is saying, that's worthless. It's vain. It's vanity to think like that. It's emptiness, idle. It's vain. Next is to aim at deception. Deception here is a lie, an untruth, a falsehood, a deceptive thing. The King James has, in this particular section, the word leasing. Leasing is an old English word for lying. So the King James, for this phrase, says, How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing and seek after lying, is what it says in the King James, for those that are reading from that version. Salem. Let's take some time to think about this. David has begun with a cry to the Lord. He's imploring God to answer, to listen, to help. He's doing that because of people that are attacking his character as the king, the representative for God to serve. Maybe you're sometimes like that. Maybe not in a position as a king, but maybe somewhere else where you're being attacked and people are mocking you and trying to bring shame to you for something that you are claimed to have either done or not done by them and something that's expected that is unreasonable or wrong. It's a lie. It's worthless. It's vain. And it matches what's happening to David. But he starts to shift now to focus them back on what the Lord has said about David and about being the king. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. I didn't do it, David's saying. The Lord has done it. The Lord has picked me and set me to be the king for himself. He has set apart. The phrase set apart is to be distinct, marked out, separated, distinguished, and sometimes to be wonderful. There's a lot of examples of setting apart something for a religious service or for something else. And maybe it's something as simple as a little cup that somebody has in a in a shelf in their house that came from their grandma, their great grandma, somebody special in their life, some object, some trinket, something that people would walk in the house and just see it as an old knick-knack and they wouldn't have any idea that it had any value. But it was set apart by that person because of its value to them. And God is saying, this has value. I'm setting it apart for service, to be separate, and to be wonderful. The godly man. A person who is faithful, kind, holy, a saint, 
and even pious. God has set him aside for himself. Whatever vain, worthless plans they might have, the psalmist is making a confident statement to them that whatever your plans are, they're worthless. They're not going to do anything. The Lord hears when I call. Again, an echo back from the earlier verse when he called to him. Now he's saying, the Lord hears when I call. This is a confident statement based upon the character of God as known by the psalmist. As we get to know God more and more, we can also develop this kind of confidence that the Lord will hear and listen to us when we pray and cry out to him. Develop that relationship. Get to know the Lord. Learn more and more about him. When you come to him and you pray, you have confidence and trust because you know him. You develop a relationship. And when you pray and you know that he's listening and he cares and he's concerned, we can cry out with great hope and great anticipation that he will answer. So consider your circumstances with confidence. You don't have to give up when it's tough. You can have confidence because God can pull you out of it. The next section is verses 4 and 5, where the psalmist is now beginning to direct everyone to trust in the Lord. Verse 4 begins, Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. First phrase, tremble and do not sin. Tremble. The Hebrew here is a word for tremble, quake, rage, quiver, be agitated, be excited, be perturbed, etc. It's a very colorful word. Basically, the idea carries with it some other things, but that's the general idea that somehow involved in this, in this emotion, this trembling, there is an agitation, there is an excitement, uh, a quivering. Um, sometimes people will add words like fear and strong caution as they use the word. Keep in mind, too, I had to look this up. This is the theological workbook of the Old Testament which is a scholarly work, and it's probably going to be just I did this for me because I wanted to know better what this word was. They're saying for this word, the primary meaning of the root is to quake or shake, from which the ideas such as shaking in anger, shaking in fear, or shaking in anticipation are derived. It's a very pictorial way to think about this. When somebody is angry, and they're so angry that they're shaking, or they're so afraid that they're shaking because of their fear, or they're so uh, they're shaking because of anticipation. Those are the elements involved in this word. It is a quaking or a shaking coming from those emotions of anger, fear, and anticipation. In Psalm 4, 4, they say this in their book. This has been translated various ways. For example, the RSV says, be angry. King James Version says, stand in awe. In light of context cited above, tremble and sin not is equally possible, which is what New American Standard has in others. There are many other slight variations on these translations. Of importance to the study, though, is this verse in Psalm 4.4. The New Testament in Ephesians 4.26 quotes that from the, the LXX is the Septuagint. LXX is uh, the... the uh, for, the way to put down 70, the Septuagint is the 70, the scholars that translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek in the 2nd century B.C. Perhaps best is Meyer's suggestion, they're saying in this book, that the negative force applies to the second imperative. In other words, the idea is, in being angry, do not sin. In other words, do not sin by anger, or in your anger, do not sin. So the, the translation in Ephesians has those ideas. 
So do not sin in your anger. Do not sin by your anger. Those are the the ideas there. And do not sin is the boundary for this. Sinning is to miss, miss the way, go wrong, incur guilt, purify from uncleanliness. So David here is admonishing his leaders to handle themselves with fear and trembling, even quaking as they process these items to make sure that they do not cross the line. He's giving the strong rebuke, whatever you do, do not sin. However justified you feel about an activity or an anger or something else, do not sin. He's drawn a solid line. In whatever way their emotional state or reaction or fear is affecting them, it is never to go to the point of sin. No anger, no fear, no trepidation, no tremors will ever be permitted if sin is added. We'll look at this a little bit from the New Testament as we look at the quote from the Septuagint translation copied from Psalm 426. And again, if you take the Hebrew Old Testament and look at the Septuagint translation, that translation is exactly the wording that Paul uses in Ephesians. Consider now occurrences of this in the New Testament. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now this added phrase, do not sin, is there very, very, very strongly because anger can so easily get out of control and out of hand that it can do more damage than good if it's not dealt with correctly. Let's look at some of these instances. The main reason here, as he adds, as Paul adds, do not even give the devil an opportunity. Don't even get close to the line. If you think it might be sin, back off. Don't try to see how close you can get. Consider these occurrences in the New Testament. Um, I've noted here the word with the Greek uh, uh, number from the Strong's Concordance. It's a very common way to, uh, to keep track of the words. From Matthew 5.22, listen to the warning about anger. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Be careful with anger. Consider Matthew 18.34. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that he owed. You remember the story. A man owed... Um, his his boss some uh, some money he couldn't repay and so he forgave him and let him go and then later he went out and grabbed one of the subordinates of him and asked him to pay the last cent and put him in prison and locked him up and this Lord moved with anger. He was angry, burning angry, shakingly frustrated with somebody who could not show mercy to someone because of the mercy he had shown to him. Consider Matthew 22, 7. The king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murders and set their city on fire. Again, you can see the various emotions, the rage, the anger. It physically moves people at times. From Luke 14, and the slave came back and reported this to his master and the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Remember, he had invited people to the wedding and they didn't come. And he was angry with that. Luke 15, but he became angry and was not willing to go in and his father came out and began pleading with him. Again, Ephesians 4.26, we've already seen that. And then in Revelation, there's a couple of occurrences in the end times. And the nations were enraged. Again, our same word here. And your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, 
the small and the great to destroy those who destroy the earth. And then one more in Revelation 12, 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman who went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So we see anger being expressed in various ways and very rarely in these instances is it justified. There are some instances which we'll get into later. One of the most interesting ones um, is the justification for anger is the time that Jesus was getting ready to heal a man. And you remember the story, it's the first few verses of Mark chapter 3, and then in verse 5, he was looking at them, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. This is the occurrence in the New Testament where Jesus tells us he was angry and grieved at the hardness of their heart. Oh, you scribes. He must have just been so animated. I can, you, just, you can feel it in the, in the way that it's, it's occurring. Here's a man who's got a withered hand, and all Jesus is going to do is heal him. And they're all worried about following some rules. Anger can be right, but only when appropriate. It can be so easily abused or misused that we're admonished strongly to do not sin. Whatever you do, do not sin. Don't come close to sin. Don't tinker with it. If you're in doubt, stop. And do not give the devil an opportunity to badmouth, to trick, to pull others in with it. So, if you have issues dealing with anger correctly, please take time to consider the scripture and possibly get counseling assistance from a trusted believer or a pastor. Many people have to deal with this area and it's difficult for many. Get help if you need it. Moving back to Psalm 4, continuing on in this verse, he moves on to meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Sailor. Meditate. Meditate here is to say, to speak, to utter, to answer, to say in one's heart, to think, to command, to promise, to intend. There's a lot of ideas involved in this. Pondering, thinking, wondering, all those kind of things are there. Biblical meditation is to fill your heart with God's word. That's biblical meditation. Eastern meditation is to empty your heart. Fill it up or empty it. The correct way is to fill it. In your heart. This is the inner man, the mind, the will, the heart, the soul, the understanding, The translations vary quite a bit. Um, In the book of Proverbs, the word occurs many, 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 many times. And in some cases it says heart. Other times it says other things about your soul or your mind. But effectively, you're meditating in your heart. You're pondering in your heart. You're wondering about these things. And we'll see later there's a time to do this during your day. Upon your bed. This is a place where you lie down, maybe a couch, maybe some place you can be where you're able to get away from the crowd and to be isolated in some way. And be still. To be silent. Be still. To wait. Dumb. Don't talk. Listen. Grow. Dumb. All these things followed by Selah. Consider this for a bit. We have these issues. We have to ponder what they're meaning. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you don't know exactly what's going on. Let the word enrich you. Pour it into your heart and then ponder it over and over again. Pastor's teaching in the book, and I'll uh, 
in the New Testament about things being repeated by, by, the, by the apostle, the writer. And he says to, I'm going to repeat these things. I'm going to remind these things. I'm going to tell you these things over and over again so that maybe when I'm gone, you'll be able to recall these things to mind. Keep pondering. Keep reminding yourself. Keep considering these things. That's what we're trying to do here is think about those things. Then he moves on to offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. David continues this admonishment of his leaders and his friends to do the right things. The sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. He's impelling them and telling them it's important for you guys to come back to where the Lord wants you to be. Offer the appropriate sacrifices. These may be leaders that are helping to do sacrificial services. They want, they want to do this with the right heart and the right attitude. The way to do that is whatever you're offering, do it with your trust in the Lord, not of your own will, but of the Lord and trust in him. So again, in these verses 4 and 5, he's directing everyone to trust in the Lord. Now he moves on to ask the Lord to bless. Earlier they were saying they weren't being blessed, and now he's asking them, and he's going to ask them to have the Lord bless them. Many are saying, who will show us any good? You could say like this, what good would it do? What good would it do? Ah, the Lord can't help with that. Who will show us any good? Well, he reminds them to lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. Lift up the light of your countenance. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when the grain and the new wine abound. Who will show us any good? Let's find out. Here, Good is explained at the end of verse 7. The phrase, when their grain and new wine abound. Who will show us any good, any harvest, any rain, any produce? It is common for good to be used poetically for the good provided by the Lord through rain and harvest and produce. Consider, for example, the grain is is harvested in the spring and the new wine is harvested in the fall. So throughout the year, they need rain, they need harvesting, they need production, they need to get those crops in and out. And every year, things have to happen for that to occur. But all through that, it only comes if the Lord blesses. So they're looking to the Lord. And they're blaming the king, but it's really they're blaming the Lord. Consider these uh, ideas here. Psalm 85, 12. Indeed, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its produce. So the idea of the good being produce. They do not say in their heart, Jeremiah 5, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain in its season, both autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of harvest. So the good that the Lord provides through the rain and is done to the harvest is for their good. Your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have withheld good from you. I couldn't fit these on one page because it would have been easier, but let me just back up here quick. Do you see here? They're wanting to have the rain the autumn rain, the spring rain, and the harvest. But it's not happening for them. Why? Because their iniquities have turned these blessings away. And their sins have withheld good from you. The good that they wanted was prohibited from getting to them because of sin in their life. Next, the phrase, lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. The light, the Hebrew idea here is the light of prosperity. Shine your prosperity on us. And then the next phrase, of your countenance. This is a favorable 
space. The idea is when you look at somebody and they're not, uh, they're not happy to see you, you can tell their face might be frowning, it might be ornery looking. Or, you, know, you can tell when you're coming up to somebody and they're glad to see you. They're welcoming you. The welcoming face, a favorable face. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. That is the countenance, a picture of a face that is favorable. Consider, for example, the ironic blessing from Numbers 6, 22 to 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you. The same word we saw in Psalm 4. Lift up his face. Shine his prosperity on you, his blessing, and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. A promise well known by all of them. The countenance of the face of God in their face. Because of this, he continues on now saying, you have put gladness in my heart. Gladness is joy, mirth, gladness, a glad result, a happy issue. <laughs> it's, just, it's just glad and happy. I'm just giggling. It's, that's the idea here. You put mirth and joy and a glad result. I am happy. I am happy. You've put that in my heart. Verses 6 and 7. He is asking the Lord to bless him. And then he ends in verse 8. Rest in peace and security in the Lord. Consider in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. In peace. Completeness. Soundness. Welfare. Peace. Calm. I will both lie down, to lie down and to rest, and sleep, to remain a long time in a sleep, a deep sleep, a good, deep sleep, restful, both at the same time. I'm not going to lie down and, and shake and quiver. I'm not going to sleep that just, you know, momentary or in and out, in and out, like, you know, just a deep, restful sleep that he gives. Consider from Psalm 127 the rest that the Lord gives in sleep. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen keep awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful laborers. For why? Because he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. God can bless you in your efforts while you're sleeping. Doing nothing. Just sleeping. He can bless you even then. That's how much he can do. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. To dwell in safety is to be secure and safe. And alone. This is isolation, withdrawal, or separation. And then figuratively, security. Again, you're going to make me dwell in safety, alone, isolated, but with security. Jesus alone with God. Consider a few of these passages to show the secret to knowing about peace and security in our dear Lord. Look, for example, at these three. Matthew 4, 1. When Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, which is him and his Lord, the truth. Matthew 14, 23. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, 
to this man on the mat. I know that the answer was prayer alone over and over and over again. Consider this, Matthew 21, 17. And he left them and went out from the city to Bethany. And he spent the night there. Mark 1, 35. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. Mark 8, 13. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. Over and over again, he got alone to be with his Father, to be secluded, to meditate, to pray. Mark 6, 46. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountains to pray. Luke 4, 42. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him. Luke 6, 12. And it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer there. Luke 22, 39 to 45. In the garden. He came out and proceeded as was his custom, as was his custom over and over and over and over. It is a habit to go to the mountainside, to pray, to be alone. The disciples also followed him. And when he arrived at the place, he said, pray that you may not enter temptation. And when he withdrew himself, they were there in the area, but he went to be alone. The stones threw away, and he knelt down and began. from heaven appeared to him and said to him, and being in agony, he was praying, they broke the stone and wept with him, saying, fall away. It's not always easy to have these conversations. Sometimes we fall away. His will is not our will. Pray. Among many of those who met, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping in the boat said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not enter temptation. John 6, 16, through 18. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and made them a promise, withdrew again to a secluded place. Thank you. 